Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear and other random stuff. In the last video, I examined my Franklin Ace 100. I serviced the power supply. I examined the peripheral cards that were in the machine and finally verified that they were recognized by the system. If you haven't watched that video yet, I invite you to watch it now. The next thing I'm going to do is grab the two disk drives for this machine and check them out. I will need a bootable version of DOS or ProDOS. ProDOS requires 64K, and with the 16K card in slot 0, it does have 64K. I'm going to test one drive at a time. This is an Apple compatible drive made by a company called Quentin. They were quite popular. Here is the connector, and it's got a projection on one side. That side must be away from the board. So if you were to try to plug it in, like this, so that projection rubbed up against the board, uh, you'd damage the, the drive for sure. Also, when you plug it in, it has to be in like that. You can't go in one way or the other, and you can't miss one row of pins. You can't plug it in so it's too far out. Again, you'll damage the drive. What should happen when I turn this on is the drive begins to boot and the first step of that booting is called recalibration where the head is driven against the stop and makes a grinding noise. That's normal. Here goes. Yeah. Quiet. Much quieter than an Apple drive. Okay, looks like this drive works. I'm not going to test it for writing though. I've connected the second drive up to slot 6 drive 1 and let's see if it boots. That's the normal sound of an Apple II drive. Okay, that sounds good. I'm going to get a catalog of the disk. Okay, let's try getting a catalog putting that disk into drive 2. Same command, almost. So catalog drive 2, it already knows that it's slot 6. Okay, drive works. The drive works and the drive controller work. Will it boot ProDOS? ProDOS requires 64K and a genuine Apple II, or actually ROMs that say Apple II. Sounds good. And it found all my cards. Language card, I.O. card, communications card, 80 column card, empty empty, disk drive, and empty. Perfect. So this computer works fine. That only leaves the monitor. This is not the monitor for this system. It was that Sanyo monitor. I'm going to get it and check that out. This is the monitor for the system. It's an NEC JB1260MA. I'm just going to open it up, clean out the dust, make sure there are no reefer capacitors inside, there could be, and then test it. Monitors with cathode ray tubes like this one can carry a large charge for a long time, like days. But this hasn't been turned on in years, so I'm not worried about it. 
Looks like it's just a matter of taking out a few screws and then it should all come apart. Best way to do this with it on its face and uh, as an aside, picture tubes are fragile. They're big glass bulbs and if you knock them or put weight on them, they can implode causing injury. I've slid out the motherboard a bit and there's my manufacturing date, February 1984, which would be very appropriate for an Apple II. If there are any Rifa capacitors, they would be with the power supply. And the power supply is where the power comes in. The power comes in right there. Right from the power transformer. And I see all kinds of things, and I don't see any Rifa capacitors. Looks good. Get a raster. Might need a little bit of adjusting, positioning it over a little bit to the right. But everything else looks good. What I'm going to do is move the entire field, that is the entire picture, over to the right. And that's done with these centering rings here. They've got paint on them, which was put there in manufacture so they wouldn't shift. There's no problem with moving those rings. As long as you don't touch the contacts on the yoke, you'll get a nasty shock from that. It's possible that I adjust the raster, move it over to the right, and then that leaves a gap on the left. If that happens, then I have to increase the width. And that is with this coil here, the width coil. Again, you don't want to be poking around too close because this is where the high voltage comes from. Though it's insulated, you never know, and you don't want to take a chance. The width control can be adjusted, but you need a special tool to do it, like one of these old TV repair tools. It must be non-metallic, because if you put a metallic tool onto that slug, you'll never be able to adjust it. You need one of these, and they come in different sizes, and I think this is the right size for this set. My video source, I'm going to use a B&K Television Analyst, model 1076. You can use just about anything. I'll use this mirror so I can watch the picture as my fingers are in the set adjusting the controls. Being nowhere near the deflection yoke, I moved it too far, because now it's opening a crack on this side. But let's go back. So the raster is centered, but it's not wide enough. So time to get to the width coil. Okay, I've got an extension on my non-metallic tool so that I don't get anywhere close to the flyback transformer. I've widened it, and I think that fills the picture now. I suppose if I had spare time, I could do something about the case. It really needs RetroBright, though it would make it look better in the short term. RetroBright is not permanent. It would still fade again. So maybe one day I'll, I'll treat this case with RetroBright. Now that the monitor is adjusted as well as can be expected, I can put it back together and connect it up to the Franklin Ace and enjoy some vintage Apple II games. Well, that wraps it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider giving me a thumbs up and subscribing to Mr. Brown's Basement for more interesting and unusual videos.